Hello, everybody. Uh, Welcome. Yeah. Welcome to all the technical issues we've been having once again to come back to us at Dissonant Waves. And we're How's all injured. I'm not injured. I'm injured as well. My, my, well, my legs hurt sometimes, but it's no injury. Uh, well, Dominic and I are, are injured. That, a bruised my bone. That sounds like a, a huge bruised... one, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, I bruised my bones too, except mine's my hip. Mine's my arm, it's the wrist. Good times. I popped We're having a good time over day. here. The, the pimple, yeah. pimple kind of hurts where I popped it. Does, does that count as an injury? No, it doesn't. Well, then get fucked, you two. Anyway, this is episode 86. Our first 2022 specific episode. Yay. We yeah. have a few, a few albums to talk about. Once again, we've got All of a Tree, Cowboy Tears, Big Thief, Dragon New Warm Mountain, I Believe in You, and of course, Hikaru Itada's Bad Mode. I kind of want to start with the, um, with the album that I know that I'm going to blast the most this week, and... Oliver Tree, I'm guessing. Yeah, I was, I was, it's got to leave a little to the imagination, but I feel like, uh, I feel like we all kind of know. Chick seems to be yeah. a little, little upset. Do you want to, you want to start this off? Because I feel like you're going to be the one who likes this album the most. Yeah, yeah. I, I do kind of like this album. Uh, the first half of it fucking sucks. Uh, but at cigarettes, yeah. it picks up and I start liking it. And uh, there actually is, there's actually a song in here I think I like more than anything off of his first album. I mean, I think uh, Cowboys Don't Cry is a fun song. Yeah, it's a fun song, but I, it's, I, it's, I it's like nowhere near his previous work. I disagree. I, I don't like Cowboys Don't Cry. I think that's actually just a shit opener. <laughs> it's one of the few songs that I get anything out of in this album. I, I think everything else is is so fucking bog standard for him, and just in general, like I could fucking turn on like mainstream radio and like you know to the cool stations that play modern music and find shit like this. Yeah, what I what I hate the most about this album is that it's actually really hard to go to all the parts of the album specifically that I hate. Like, ugly is beautiful. We, we covered that obviously when it came out and that album was full of a lot of moments on on that record and if you hated those moments you would be able to fucking tell and you could say okay here's the moments that i hate here's the moments that i love and on ugly is beautiful most of that was actually love for us but here this is just fucking there this is so this is so safe like let's put aside all the fucking country hate that i've had recently and all that, that shit and blah blah because this album does does uh introduce elements of country and stuff which is which is kind of like hey yeah trying to do the country album but realistically it doesn't actually fucking use that shit so we can just no, throw, it doesn't. throw is that this aside safe? is this safe this is this is a pretty fucking safe record comparatively to yeah. what fucking oliver tree can fucking put out and that's why this is yeah like, if this Please. is his first rec if this was his first record i'd be like okay well this is a little disappointing but we can see where he goes but he's already shown what he can fucking do there's a lot of theories out there that i've seen online and it's like oh he's putting up he's just putting out whatever music and shit like that uh to get out of the label or other shit like that kind of defending this and i don't know if that's true or not but all i know is that this well, album is out here of the song, i'm not good at goodbyes mm. And so, let's yeah. let's not forget that back in 2020 with Ugly is Beautiful, he said this is my last ever album and ever all that shit like that. And we, you can never tell with Oliver Tree if that was supposed to be like a joke or not. And obviously now, as we can tell, it's like it wasn't really because he's still pointing out music. And but is this I, a joke or not? I I don't know, but it's not a good one if it is. That's that's my, the my kind problem. Of thing. My problem is, like, it's kind of the same problem that I have with Ugly is Beautiful. The more I think about Ugly is Beautiful, the, le the less I think that one holds up for me. Because oh. I think his his persona on that on that record fit that vibe better as, like, a 90s, like, young millennial memer type guy. Like, that made yeah. more sense on that album. Yeah, I can think of that. But now he's shedding that persona, theoretically, to bring on what he calls, like, this emo cowboy thing. But musically, it's just the same shit again. 
and it, it's even Ill, it's just more ill-fitting now because it's like he's trying to do these other things he's trying to have this different kind of topic influence genre influence but it doesn't matter it's all the same type of songs be- as before just new subjects i, I would yeah. argue as well that kind of on here like with ugly is beautiful you could tell the songs apart like like jerk sounds nothing like uh me myself and i yeah and those are two opposite yeah. sides on here but then the cowboys don't cry and cowboy tears they're kind of very fucking similar there's there's actually only one song um on the on this record that i listened to and i thought maybe if i had to listen to one in my playlist it would probably be playing with fire that was the only one where I thought, I thought where there was kind of an attempt to try something else on this record. There were oh. some lyrical moments on here, which I actually thought, okay, well, at least this is at least some of the humor that he's trying to do. Like, Chicks is kind of right with cigarettes is where the album tries to pick up a bit. I, I, thought, yeah. I thought there was some kind of humor in there, but I felt like it was also just kind of very dried out as well. Like, oh, yeah, I smoke all these cigarettes, I smoke all these cigarettes. I mean, it's kind of funny, but it's like, I've heard the joke mm-hmm. once now, I don't really fucking find it funny the second time. Yeah. I like cigarettes because it feels like a song that's about something. That's, like, actually specific and on topic. Mm-hmm. Like, for a lot of these songs, like, Suitcase Full of Cash, I just get the image of, like, wasn't it the song where he's singing about, like, being buck naked and shit? Like... I get that image. I get the image of him handing out cash as they go over in the opening, and like that's all that song is to me. Mm-hmm. California, I just think about that fucking nasally voice that he has going off key and shit. I, I like uh, California. The one thing I actually am going to compare this to as well, which is an artist that I was thinking I was going to cover early in this year, I might still do later, but I haven't. Was um was Tom Cardi, and his <clears> music. <throat> uh, if you haven't heard. It, it is mostly satirical, kind of like, ah, oh, we're doing humor and stuff like that. And, you know, sometimes it's the dick jokes and everything. And anyway, he, he has a song that was, was quite successful here, Mixed Messages, where that one starts off as kind of a whole, kind of like, oh, I'm sending this girl mixed messages kind of thing. And it has all those jokes regarding to that. And then ends up in this whole kind of tirade about how he's going to punch his um girlfriend's dad in a dick constantly. But yeah, that's one that goes on a goddamn tangent. You don't really know too much about it, but it actually still kind of sticks to the subject that it was originally trying to go on about, even if it yeah. has that joking tangent. And here, if things if, if things lose focus here, they lose it for good. And it's yeah, it's like, like okay, all we get from this is more '90s nostalgia, but like it just doesn't fit. It, nothing about it fits together in like this cohesive interesting way like even the music videos don't really seem to do anything in the same way that they might have for the first one like the his imagery he's just a fucking tiger king wannabe yeah a little on this one yeah and like okay he's fucking doing a trick on a fucking atv or whatever the fuck he's got like a more southern accent or whatever but like i think that just reveals him to be like just a guy that wants attention like he's just another California guy who wants to be noticed, who wants to seem like he has all these tricks up his sleeve, like some kind of fucking Andy Kaufman shit. Yeah. And I mean, the ironic thing about that is that he already was noticed. I mean, uh, going into Ugly is Beautiful, his biggest hit was Alien Boy, and that was being constantly played and promoted at every point. But now, now that's not even his biggest hit anymore because Life Goes On got um got more traction. And yeah. I don't, I, I don't even mind that song. I actually think Life Goes On is fine. Uh, I've seen a lot of people think it's a very weak Oliver Tree song. I think uh, it's weak it, to a lot of the to the strong songs that he has put out. It grades on you if you've heard it on TikTok a thousand times. Ah, yeah. Well, anything would when you hear it a thousand times. The Dumb O' No song. But, Fuck. I hate that song. Fuck. God, yeah. No, but like, I don't understand why he just doesn't go country. Why doesn't he actually just do it? I actually probably would have respected this album a lot more if it just went country. Yeah, if it went more in like the, the like California was probably the most countryish song, which might explain why you hated it so much. But uh, yeah, I, I dug California myself. It just none of it feels like the thing with being like an Andy Kaufman type is it, like what is sincere, what is just fake, what is meant to be part of the act. That that was cool with the old persona. That was cool. 
with when he burst on the scene with that like fucking the sunglasses and fucking Jinko jeans looking ass. Mm-hmm. But this is a persona that's just not as interesting, not as stark, not as like just it, like it's just not a thing compared to that first one. Mm. Yeah. Like especially I, since he had the arc of like quitting music and then coming back for this. And it's also like he still has the bowl cut and he doesn't really still have the bowl cut, which is like are you trying to change it or not? And I feel like I feel like that's a really kind of good uh a, a good description aesthetically it's to what this album is. Like it feels like it wants to be a big change, but it just doesn't want to be a big change. It, it's a bowl cut it, mullet. And it yeah. doesn't it's it's not good with either. Like it's actually just I would have actually rather if he went for aesthetic. I know this is going a bit out of the music. If he had just kept either, uh, either one of them, if he's if he's going to go for the change, just fucking go full full on with it. Don't go with the goddamn half assing it, and then expecting it to be like, oh, this is a national progression because this doesn't feel natural. This progression, it just feels just like a forced fucking album. I, I'm not going to go into any of the theories about why this is done because artists can do whatever the fuck they want. I'm just yeah, I'm just I don't really care about the theories of why it's done we don't know because he's not going to tell us yeah all i know yeah. is that this album is out and it's just a disappointment i i i don't think this is going to go down to my worst albums of the year or anything but i do think i'm still going to be very disappointed by this at the end of the year <laughs> that's uh, you, you you say that now i guarantee you it's going to be there we have this discussion at least once a year with, with an album that's, that's why be that's, awesome. that's why i say i don't know I'm just being, I'm just but, being like, honest there. It could be. It, they, we could have some worse uh, albums. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make a bold claim that I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, can, I, can, I give, can I offer a different perspective because I actually kind of like this album. Go ahead. Uh, I think the first half of this album is just like the the radio singles that are not really cohesive at all. It feels kind of like stuff that he wrote more as the uh, as like this, the first joke persona and like. Um, it's just all, all like it's ugly is beautiful part two and it couldn't really live up to that but on the latter half i really i really dig songs like cigarettes uh particularly balloon boy with like that just macabre opening about how uh, like the flesh falling from his bones and the teeth falling out of his mouth and just his soul floating into the sky i just love that imagery myself and uh yeah and just on the back half it gets a lot better i think and it's it feels like an entirely different album just if you look at the back half of the album i disagree yeah i i mean there's a lot more that i can do to kind of criticize this album but really every because because i compare it a lot to ugly is beautiful but i still listen to to songs of ugly is beautiful the songs yeah i still still listen to the album still hold up yeah me and my is easily better than anything here well, that's what I was gonna say. Like, we compare this to, to just kind of how much of a surprise in a good way that "Ugly Is Beautiful" was. Like, the singles were good on that, but my my fear always going into that album was that it was gonna be a couple good singles and then just the kind of just their songs. But even if you didn't like the, the deep cuts, like some of the songs off it, the deep cuts were so varied and had the same kind of energy and effort put into it as the singles that it was so so surprising yeah. and granted i feel like there's the same amount of effort in the deep cuts on here but they're just there's there was no effort really that the same no, i'm not gonna say no effort that's a bit harsh kind of thing but like that same level of effort that we kind of feel on the singles is in the deep cuts on here as well it doesn't feel like it's really tried to be anything different in there we have like ugly is beautiful pretty much because every song was so kind of stand out and so uh unique on there you could kind of tell every song apart on there and I know I talk a lot about contrast and flow and stuff like that, and I do think I do think that's the one thing that Ugly is Beautiful suffers on. I think because it, it, a lot of it does try to be those grand moments, you know, you do kind of go a bit like over it at sometimes, and I think the album is disjointed. But I do think I, that everything else it fucking tries makes up for that. I I think the disjointedness of Ugly is Beautiful works in its favor. It's I it's, it's a little depends on the day for me on that one. I want to say two things. Number one, it's hard to follow up an album like Ugly is Beautiful, no matter what you yes. think of it. It's mm. just a huge album. There's so much going on. It's a debut. If it was something that was more simple, I don't know, like the first Muse album or something, you could easily follow that up with something better. Mm. Yeah. This 
could very well just be an attempt to get that second album out there and just focus then on with something else. I don't know that I doubt that's true, but like, yeah. if there's going to be a second album. Might as well be this. Yeah. My, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this just a quick final thought. Sorry, uh, tricks, and I we got some more words to say. I, I'm assuming that just hold that thought. Yeah. If, if Ugly is Beautiful came out in the year two thousand or so, we'll, we'll say it, and then it's the same kind of rollout here, and then in two thousand and two that we had um, we had Cowboy Tears. I I would assume that two years ago we would have had a Todd in the Shadows train records about this uh album so. Yeah, you're not wrong. You're not. You're really not wrong. Um, I think how but, about would have worked better in 2002. Yeah, I, I, I will say, um, if this album brings back the ironic cowboy aesthetic, I'm all for it. I will, the thing I will say is that this album reminds me of the things I did not like about Ugly is Beautiful more than the things I liked about it. And I think that despite Oliver being a really good visual artist and a really cool like performance artist in the modern day kind of persona. His music just never lives up to it as much as he wanted to. I do wish we, I, I do wish we did get an ugly as beautiful too, if we were gonna get this like, I know, I know yeah. it wouldn't have been as good as ugly as beautiful no matter what, but I do wish, like, if we're gonna get this, I may as well just done ugly as beautiful too. I think this album is better than you guys are giving credit for myself, but I, I don't know. I just got a weird soft spot for it, I guess. Look, if we didn't have, if we didn't have disagreements on this podcast it would be a circle jerk and uh no, no dissing to circle jerks but uh we don't need to be one of those ones <laughs> yeah we, we, uh, well on the internet. uh we we, uh, we also wouldn't be dissonant in our waves yeah never mind <laughs> kick tricks out the, that's just a swing and a miss there yeah just like it, just... Three pros. look my favorites on this album are cash machine 1995 it's a long <laughs> fucking album uh favorites on this album probably playing with fire and you know, cigarettes is a 50 50 it's not that the song really makes me like like it it's just better than the rest and least favorite uh cowboys don't cry probably it's uh, it's such a shit opener uh, my favorite probably cowboys don't cry my least favorite is whatever one was about him being fuck naked on the car uh, i was playing with fire i don't don't mind that one i thought that i thought Instrumental, it was better than the rest. Um, my favorites are Balloon Boy by like a country mile. I think that's better. Than, I like that song better than anything off of Ugly is Beautiful. Okay. Um, uh, then, uh, then it's probably California and Cigarettes. And uh, my least favorite is Freaks and Geeks because I can remember fucking nothing about it. It's, it's, I'm it, a it's, loser. I'm a weirdo. It's incredible how this, this album started off with like three singles and. It's it's such a shit opening. Yeah. Uh, which one do we want to go to next? So it's only uphill from here. Well, uh, since we went maybe not in my opinion. opinion. Since we went to controversial opinions about the Oliver Tree album, let's go to my controversial opinions about Big Dragon New Warm Mommy Mountain. Did you just <laughs> Big Dragon New Warm Mommy Mountain? Oh my god! You gotta fucking get the mommy milkers out the next time you do the description for this album title. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, 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 I'll introduce uh, so Big Thief I discovered a little late because I usually do that with artists that aren't Australian I uh, discovered them in 2019 which I guess isn't too late they're kind of worth starting to break out a bit more uh, UFOF was actually one of my favourite albums of that year I put the title track from that in my top 10 uh, songs as well you know, as that album in there. Uh, followed them for quite a bit that year as well because they also released uh, another album, which uh, the single Nut was a fucking banger as well that they put out there. Didn't like it as much as UFRF, but a lot of people seem to think it's one of the best songs they've ever uh, put out. And after a bit of a break, including Ad- uh, Adrian Lenker and some of the other uh, members of this band who names I can't ever remember because... Well, let's let's face it. Adrian Lenko is probably the kind of like most seen from this band. Mm-hmm. Singers uh, usually are. Yep, singers usually are. Um, 
we, we finally got some singles out last year, which I kind of ignored because I was, I was focusing on a lot of other stuff that just kind of happens when artists release the music late in the year. Uh, but they've come out now with a big double album, which I don't, I don't like it as much as Zero for RF. I'll, I'll put that out there. But I think it's, it's got a nice, nice kind of collection of songs that it's still been an interesting lesson for me. And now that I've said that, Dominic, you can go just tell me how much you hate it. So, I want to say a couple things. The big thing with this album is just, I just don't fucking care about it. <laughs> like, this is the album I was afraid Shaky Gray was in the Middle East would be. Yeah. This is a black hole vortex of folk country songs that some sound maybe a little bit cooler than others. Some may have a little bit more interesting instrumentation than others, but it all sounds the same to me. The 80 minutes of it, it's a black hole. Same mid as fuck. I, I, I've I've got to disagree because I, I, I feel like I'm going to get a fucking... I, I'm going to find the fucking place where he inserted the blade after I do this comment. But I feel like if you like Stefan Stevens, then it's kind of weird you don't like this because a lot of this is soft acoustic or soft kind of like... Like, it's not as grand as Stefan Stevens can get, but a lot of a lot of his like softer stuff is very similar in style to this album. That's true. I don't know what to say to that. I just... Yes. It's not the same to me. Sufjan is a little more refined, if that makes sense. Like, I, his I, emotion carries more... Like, his voice carries more emotion. I understand. I empathize with him a lot more. I, yeah. I, I don't... I don't think emotion is always needed for a song to be truly good. Like, no. yes, some of the greatest songs out there are, are very emotional. So so far, probably the best song that we covered from 2022 is the song I just mentioned. And that song's pretty emotional, but I still think there's some great moments on this record that it doesn't have... Like, I'm not gonna put out this as saying this is my fucking favourite album of the year or any of that shit. Again, I don't even like it as much as UFO F, which I think uh, the shorter runtime allowed it to be a little bit more kind of impactful and varied in a shorter period of time, which is what makes a good Big Thief album, but I still think there's a lot of good moments on here. Like, I fucking love Simulation Swarm. I think that song's just very kind of earwormy, which a lot of the songs that I like off this are. I disagree with this sounding the same as well. I think there's a lot of moments on here where they've actually tried some stuff they haven't tried before. Uh, when, Brandon, I have no context to who Big Thief is before. I've never listened to any yeah, of no, stuff. That's, that's fair. That, yeah. that, is, that is fair, but I don't care. Uh, like, a change into time escaping is fucking apples and oranges, and that's my. We, I, that, I that, is, that is the part I remember the most. I will say because time escaping has a really interesting intro. Mm. It's very kind of like making. It, it's probably the most experimental song off this record, admittedly. I don't think. Mm -hmm. I I do think you are somewhat right in which there are like moments on here which get a bit black holy, but I think there's still enough kind of like strong moments on this record for it to kind of get past that if i personally put out this record yeah i would probably cut it down a bit i don't think this needs to be a double album it can be just a, a single album but it doesn't mean i'm complaining about more big thief here it's very soothing very relaxing i love putting it on in the background so i'm going to listen to simulation swarm constantly throughout this year because i just fucking love her vocals on that i love the instrumentation on it they use some kind of fucking I forgot what they fucking use on it to make some of the uh, fucking bass sounds on that. Tricks you would probably know. I, I, I couldn't tell you. This this album felt like if you were to play like an RPG based in uh, like just a rural area. It just feels like rural RPG background music. A lot of it. I don't... I, don't, I, I can't really like... I can't really fight you two on that one. If you don't like the album, then there's just not really much I can do, but... Like, like, like it it's okay. Like, it's just yeah. yeah, yeah I, it's white noise I to me. But I recognize that it's a really big achievement for them. That there's a lot of songs, and they did the, they did a lot of work. Yeah, I I appreciate them for that. I don't not that I hate the album at all. I just don't care well, about well, it. What I, what I was gonna say is just like it's because kind of like here. I guess I guess this is kind of like the difference between folk and country for us. I feel like with with country, that's just something that I'm so fucking bored by, I can't fucking remember it. And then when we get to this kind of, like, 
level of folk. And it's not always been kind of a thing. And I guess we haven't ex- explored it too much ago, but it seems to have that fucking opposite effect. Because I have a feeling you two will, will be like, compare this. We're going to we're gonna just fucking say it. I'm comparing it to Shaky Graves. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We do, we do that. And I can't fucking remember a single Shaky Graves song after all the listening I've done. And then. And that's almost me with this. Yeah, I feel like it's a complete fucking flip over here. And yeah, I, th- I, th- I think you're right. That's fine, but fuck you two. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I, I like Adrian Lenker's voice. She sounds kind of like uh, BB Bridgers meets Dolly Parton and Stevie Nicks, which is cool. She actually yeah. reminds me a lot of um of Julia Stone, to be honest, because uh, she's got a quite a uh, a feminine voice. Sure. And yeah. I don't. I don't know how much Angus and Julia Stone has ever been played overseas, outside of probably whatever was on Life is Strange. That was good. Place. I mean, I listened to Life is Strange. I don't remember the track though specifically. No, me either. I think. I think they helped with the soundtrack at <laughs> the last one. Oh, the oh, newest uh, one. The newest one. one? Yeah. yeah, I haven't played that one either. I haven't played it myself, but I bought it. And I need to fucking play it. I did but buy it. Yeah. It, it, it's. Adrian, uh, Adrian Lenker's voice is quite, like, feminine. It's very, very kind of, like, I know it's, like, a stereotype kind of thing, but it's very soft. It doesn't, doesn't have any kind of, like, I don't know what, it's a hard thing to kind of describe, uh, describe when you use the terms masculine and feminine to describe, uh, to describe vocal styles, but, like, you listen and you kind of get what I mean. Yeah. I am looking through my notes. Um, it looks like one of the songs I reacted to more was Heavy Bend. Because it was a bit more dreamier, spacier, shorter. Uh, it kind of had a 90s influence, kind of like the other stuff we listened to this week did. Yeah. So I think I appreciated it for that. I think I think the first half of this album as well is a lot more interesting than the second half, despite my favorite song being on the second half. I think... Uh, so I, like, I disagree. So, fair enough. I have no opinion either way. Wake Me Up the Drive was kind of cool, I guess. Hmm. I just think, I think it does a little more, I think it does a little more in the first half than it does in the second, but I feel like the second one's a bit, like, second half's a bit more coherent, I guess. Red Moon is where it started, started clicking a bit more for me. Fair enough, fair enough. I feel like that would just kind of be a more d- <laughs> disagreement we have on this one. Blue yeah. Lightning, I think, was interesting. That was more of a, like, a studio recording one. I don't mm-hmm. know. Uh, hard to say. I'm really looking at my notes for something to glean here. Uh, that's fair enough. Look, I think I think it is also quite risky, I guess, to kind of just like come back after three years and then just go, okay, we're doing a double album as well. I appreciate mm-hmm. the hell out. Yeah, yeah. Especially like, especially after 2019, they're like, hey, we're more prolific now because they suddenly just put out two albums, and it's not like they weren't prolific. Uh, before so you're so. saying that they put out a double album in 2019. They well, they didn't put out a double album, but they put out two albums pretty close to each other's dates. I think there was only a couple months in between them. It was kind of like it yes. wasn't a part one or a part two. It was like they're two different albums, but yeah, they were quite prolific. They, really they were probably worked on together and actually contrast each other in some ways. I'm sure. Mm. Yeah. So they're almost like sibling projects. Mm. Yeah, and then again, like they've done all this solo stuff and everything, and then they just put out this double album and for for what it is it's still quite fucking good i i'm not putting in the opinions that i didn't like it or anything like that like these albums have been critically acclaimed uh yeah. quite, quite well, and are getting quite a lot of traction as well so they've kind of just appeared again and said okay we're putting out a double album and it just fucking worked and um, i wish them the best of luck in the in life and i really love that for them mm. yeah and again it doesn't look like um their solo projects are going to slow down as well. I think it's just quite incredible how kind of suddenly prolific the members of this band are, and then they can just go back into Big Feet whenever the fuck they want to, and then just pull out something like this. There's a lot of bands that couldn't really do that. Like, it's really really hard to give examples and stuff, but like, there's obviously there's obviously a lot of bands that are very much focused on whoever the front man is, or front woman, or front whatever, <laughs> And it's kind of like solo project. Whenever, whenever one person puts out a solo project for them, it usually doesn't do well for two reasons. One, the, 
if it's the front uh, if it's the front person doing the um the side project or the solo project there it's not really kind of seen as a solo project because the other act is kind of like their project anyway or the other mm-hmm. artist it's like no one really fucking cares about them but on here i mean yeah one has stood out a bit more than the other but the other ones are still kind of like noticed and appreciated even if i forget their fucking names mm-hmm. so it, i it, do appreciate yeah, you can go first you can go first I was, it was a different topic entirely but i do appreciate that uh Adrian and Buck Meek were married, got divorced, and still are in this band together. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's a, that, you can appreciate that quite a bit. It's kind of like the White Stripes. Yeah, I guess, but there wasn't the weird sibling part of it, too. Well, that, hmm. that, that that's like just saying that out of context. If someone's just kind of not known about the White Stripes there, they're just kind of just go like, well, wow, siblings, what? But that... Uh. That wasn't weird. That was just Jack White saying, hey, we don't want the fucking media to constantly keep going on about how we're a couple. Oh, fair enough, I guess. That's, that's, I that's, that's honestly just genius in Jack. Like, I, I could probably say safely, if, if me and my partner are in a, in a band together, and our whole, and we're, we're all popular, and we're just there trying to put music out and stuff, we wouldn't want the goddamn media to keep going like, oh, so you're a couple, oh, so you're a couple... Would, would rather actually them just fucking talking about, you know, the music we're putting out. And that's that's what happened with the White Stripes when everyone thought they were fucking siblings. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. So, but yeah, no, you're all right. They didn't they didn't try to tell each other that they were our siblings, but they also don't have the same level of popularity. So maybe they would have. I mean, there's plenty of time. They're building up their reputation. Yeah. I don't really have much more to say. I like this album. I don't. I don't really care if if you two don't because I'm going to still be listening to Simulation Swarm as as fucking much as I can. I, I don't think it's going to be song of the year. Uh, Watch I'm going to go. It's going to be a song of the year, uh, especially. <laughs> yeah, when, it's, it's, especially when I'm considering song of the year so far as um placing instead of the blade. Yeah. That will probably yeah. be topped. That will probably be topped, but we'll see. Uh Good album. I enjoy it, and it's also like showing a much better return than fucking all of the tree did, so it wins on that. Yeah, I, I think I prefer Oliver Tree to this. Yeah, well, you prefer I definitely Shaky prefer this Fire, Oliver so. Tree. Like this is fine. I can live with listening to this again, and it's fine. <laughs> Oliver Tree, there's just not much for me to glean. Uh, favorites, I've already really said. Least favorites, I don't think there's actually a bad song off this album, so. Favorites, Time Escaping, uh, Heavy Bend, least favorites, I don't really care. Anything else is just below those two, I guess. Uh, favorites, uh, Red Moon, uh, 12,000 Lines, Simulation Swarm, and the rest is really just white noise to me. Oh, so we didn't really talk about it, uh, but the album art on here is very, very simplistic, and I think really it kind of goes into the tone of this album as well. Yeah, I, I the album art is probably the best part of this album. And I got ruined of the album art after I noticed that they actually drew the fucking butt for the bear. Yeah. <laughs> but did you see in the YouTube videos how they actually also move? Yeah, I know. It's so fucking adorable. I do like it a lot. And someone's what? edited it so the bear's just going anyway. His Wonder Wall. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I love that. All right, let's let's go on with the last album. <laughs> All right, Hikaru Watada, Bad Mode, the the, mo- the boldest Evangelion and Kingdom Hearts crossover that ever lived. We got singles from the last Evangelion movie, uh, Kingdom Hearts 3, a few of their other singles that have come out, and a bunch of the deeper cuts, too, that have kind of amassed over the last few years and kind of capstoning a 20-plus year career now that has produced some of Japan's biggest modern hits ever. Uh, their first album, uh, First Love, has sold something like 9 million, 10 million copies in Japan. And so, among some of the most successful artists to ever live, ironically, uh, born in New York City, 
moved there in college mostly oh. to pursue more of a singing career after things didn't really take off super well here in the in the states mm -hmm. just, just, um, just quickly talking uh about sales in japan and stuff there yeah i still think one of the um one of the craziest kind of like uh thoughts about music and especially how well it's sold everyone kind of talks about how one of the most uh, successful acts of all time is the beatles and that's that's obviously true but i'm pretty sure in japan the ventures sold uh twice as much as the beatles did there probably i would so, not be surprised so for some reason they decided surf rock was the uh was the sound of japan in the 60s I, I, I don't blame Japan in the 60s. I, I don't blame them either. But, yeah, to, to, to kind of give you a little bit, I don't want to get bogged down too much in background, but, you know, uh, became more famous for songs like Simple and Clean for Kingdom Hearts and kind of made a career out of that for a long time and doing other kind of tie-in media songs. Um had several several number one albums in japan eventually came out as non-binary last year which is cool mm -hmm. uh it's kind of it's kind of considered like their parents were also very into the music industry as well so there it's like you know the quintessential gen x child of music industry becomes famous musician in their own right kind of thing as well sure sure yeah but i came into this album really liking it more than i expected this I, this album, uh, yeah. you want you want to go first actually because I might go and start a tangent over there. No, I just like I really dig it. I really appreciate both the the big singles from the media projects as well as some of the album specific stuff. It is better than I anticipated. Go ahead. Yeah, this album's definitely better than I um, anticipated, and it, it it would definitely easily be my number one if we chose it last week. I, I'm not so fucking big on this album. I'm not big into, I just a. I'm gonna say Asian pop because like the K-pops, the J-pops, the all the other pops and stuff like that. I haven't ever really been big into, and this album's not really changing my opinion. Despite that, it has quite a lot of more Western producers on here. Like it's got um, floating points. It's got A. G. Cook. The, and it's got fucking Skrillex, on here. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's like uh, that's pretty like western there or the more sounds of that kind of that and i'm still not really too interested in this stuff but i actually come out appreciating this a lot more than i thought i was going to i mean i'm i'm, I'm a big fee fanboy so spoilers that's gonna be my fucking number one but it's who really fucking cares about the rankings when a lot of that's gonna be biased anyway just going on mm. on to here though i think there's a lot of interesting moments that I just like, okay, that's cool, but I'm just not going to go back to it. <laughs> I, I like I, this I, album, I, but I don't like this genre. I just thought, like, this is not really J-pop, it's just really, though. There's much more going on here than that. This is not I, just I, like, yeah, a yeah. yeah, no, it's a I, lot I, of I do. Thing, relaxing, house music, even. I do Based agree, here, but there's you... also, there is also a lot of similarities into it, besides just kind of language. Like, I, I, I've, as as the, I'm trying to think of the good words to say in here, but I can't remember the pretentious words. I, I, as the pretentious man I am, I um I I know all about the world and have travelled it, including have been in Japan for around one week. Uh in my whole life in total, and most of that was in a hotel. But I've still, yeah, I've, I've I've been there. I can remember the sounds of of what they were playing in the shopping centres and stuff over there, and kind of getting a good. A good idea, and the way that she sings a lot of the, uh, these songs, a, a way how a lot of them are still produced, are very kind of um, reminiscent of it. Because there's this kind of big thing that you actually notice about a lot of this style of pop, and that that's yeah. that's the bass is not really existent. Yeah, it's it's there, but it's not really existent, and. I, I, I don't hate that it doesn't exist. I, I actually there were some there were some acts that granted a bit, you know, outside of that that do kind of uh go on to this kind of whole like style a bit. Like I like Kara Kara Benito, which isn't which I think that one's a bit more western and stuff, but obviously 
obviously the uh, the singer of that kind of goes into her Japanese heritage and kind of starts to use a lot more of that kind of style in there. And I think these things can work, but when I kind of listen to even one that's a bit more 50-50 like this and more accessible to me, I'm still just mm-hmm. not really into it. That's fair. Trix, you haven't really said much yet. Ah, uh, this actually really surprised me, and I really like this album, if I'm going to be completely honest. <laughs> okay, um, talk about it. What, what do you like? Uh, yeah, I, I, not much. I just, it's a vibe. I, I listened to this a lot while I was just laying down, not moving from my hip, and yes. uh, Bad Mode's a killer opener. Um, yeah. Pink Blood comes to. I really liked Pink Blood. Um, I'm not going to attempt to say it, but uh, track seven and uh, track six, not in the mood. Yeah. I'm not in a position to try and fumble my way around another language right now. But uh, yeah, I just. Not in the mood, it's so good. It's It's just a good. It's just a good album. I I really enjoyed it. The remixes were cool. Yeah. Yeah, I like. I think Bad Mode is a great track. Like, I, I love the ending of it. It's just. Like, the whole song is about, like, okay, there's this couple, and the one's, like, looking at the other and noticing that they're not having a good time, that they're in, like, a bad way, kind of something's bothering them, and the whole song's kind of, like, about, do I talk to them about this, you know, do I dare approach this, and kind of the different ways in which they would do it, but also ultimately being, like, I don't want to fuck this up. The implication being that in previous relationships, they fucked it up somehow. And I think that is really interesting song, like idea to write about. I don't know. I I like like I like the subjects of the songs, and I like that the whole ending of the song is just them singing. I don't want to fuck it up again. Yeah. One thing that's kind of like always struck me about this uh, this album rollout as well, though, is that the sing like more than half this, this album is singles. And yeah. some of them don't even seem to have been made for this album. I don't really think they were re-recorded for this album or anything as well, because it's kind of just there. And there are times where this does feel a bit more like a compilation than an album, and it's kind of hard to to kind of tell a bit because a lot of the songs still are very similar. But like the first the first single for this album was in twenty nineteen. So we're we're like almost two years into COVID, and we got an album out here that's had a single before that. Well, yeah, Kingdom Hearts, Ooh, yeah. sure. and almost a year before COVID. It's like yeah, Five Fears was a huge thing. Yeah, and yeah, obviously <laughs> it might not have been created for the for the album specifically and just put onto it. You know, artists artists can do that. Artists can do whatever the fuck they want. Yeah, but it's kind of like yeah. this is is this kind of like an album that was made for an album or is this just because they haven't put out an album in a while and they got a bunch of singles that they may as well it seems like really only the last last single looking at the dates here might have actually been planned to have been a single for the album because everything else is like six or like seven months like Pink Blood which is the second last one is like seven months before the album which is quite a long time I still can yeah. specifically be, but then it starts to get into a year, and then two years, and then, like, Face My Fears is three years and one day before the album. <laughs> now, yeah. now, the the Wombats put out a single, like, two years before they finally released their fucking album before, and that one just seemed to be like, oh, they created the single, and fucking had writer's block, but I don't think that was the case here. I think that they, they just kind of put out an album because they had to, and if, if, that's, if that's what you want to do, yeah, but doesn't always translate to a great album it's just a great collection of songs at best and it's a good collection of songs i i i, I do still like this album I, if someone put it on i will enjoy it but it's just like it's not really much that's making me want to go back to it that's fair yeah. i think part of it is that the the deeper cuts kind of match the energy of some of the the singles too i think is what helps it like, I think One Last Kiss is a really great, relaxed vibe of a song that was used in a gigantic movie and really was one of my favorite singles of 2021 that I completely forgot about coming around to year-end stuff. But 
really appreciate that track. But then, like, you get later into, like, Not in the Mood and Somewhere Near Marseille, and they're just such... They're longer songs, but they're vibes. They're just... You're kind of sitting in there soaking it up and kind of just going with the flow of them. They're just... They're good house tracks. They're good just, like, fucking lay down and listen to it kind of tracks. Yeah. Like, it's we don't really cover that much, like, relaxing kind of chiller music like this. Like... We did Japanese wallpaper forever ago, and that was the kind of thing where, Ritz, you were like, yeah, just kind of put it on the background and just kind of let it be. Mm. And yeah, it'll enjoy I, it a lot more. Yeah, I can't, like, I can't disagree with that, but I also do listen to Japanese wallpaper like and focus on it, so... And, like, yeah, the, the, re- the remixes here aren't exactly, like, helpful in terms of, like, you know, record structure or anything like that, but... In terms of, like, the first 10, 11 songs, you know, Somewhere Near Marseille is kind of the ending. You yeah. can say the Beautiful yeah. World version is kind of a little coda to that because it relates back to One Last Kiss and everything. But mm-hmm. that those core tracks on their own are a pretty solid listen. Yeah, I, 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 I'm kind of, like, out of things to say like I, I like i did reiterate i guess i will reiterate not i did i think uh, i think out of all the kind of more I, I call it asian pop i don't know if that's a proper term to call it because i mean i'm just trying to get that whole kind of like region uh into one one umbrella but they obviously all do have different sounds i think this is yeah. the the most interesting one that we're definitely covered from it i yeah i mean it doesn't bts at all <laughs> Yeah. Unless you want to call Paranol K-pop, which I will wonder. <laughs> but, I mean, um, Paranol is a ska band, and <laughs> Paranol is a K-pop band. Yeah. Like, I mean, Paranol is just a guy in South yeah. Korea. Yeah. I was saying, when it comes to, like, yeah, when we've gone to a lot of the, the music that's done in other languages and stuff like that, it, it, it doesn't hit the most interesting, but if we branch it just into the pop than it is. That's I mean, like, that's the kind of way I can describe this. Like, it's, it's really the most interesting thing we've done when we start to get into, um, into pretty heavy specifics to compare it to. But when it comes yeah, I mean, to this all over branching thing that, that we've done and stuff, it's just like, yeah, this is a fun thing we did. Yeah, I mean, yeah. BTS is a fair comparison because, again, looking at album sales, like they are a little bit comparable. Like, BTS is not maybe not nearly as, like, long-lasting and impactful because, like, Hikaru Otada is considered one of the most important songwriters in recent decades, especially in Japan. But mm. I, I do think there is a comparison to be made in terms of, like, hey, that's a really popular group now. This is someone who's been really popular for a long time and has kind of the track record to back it up. And I, I, so like I said, I do, think, I do think the... Um... The producers on this album are uh, very like interesting to kind of be working on here. Uh, one that we also didn't mention is also on the um the Skirk song is Pooh Bear, which is such a, a shit name, which we don't really focus too much, but uh, it's still a pretty big producer because uh, he was the one who's produced all Justin Bieber's songs. Yeah, the funny thing, oh, the funny thing to me too, is that the the first before even uh, simple and clean the first really big western exposure people had to hikaru Itada was the it was a track on rush hour 2 yeah you posted um, that d- that was produced by fucking fro williams and the neptunes mm. yeah which is so fucking wild to think like that they started their career like their career or their beginning of their career was kind of marked by that and like they've so surpassed and gone to a different thing a different direction than any of that yeah like i don't know i i really appreciate kind of this record and kind of the, the interesting footnotes of like if you're a kingdom hearts fan if you're an evangelion fan there's a lot to appreciate here i think and like it's kind of a culmination of like that those whole sagas coming to like a close of some sort you know, everyone was waiting for Kingdom Hearts 3. Everyone's waiting for years for the Evangelion movies to end and finish. So, for people who are fans of that stuff, this album kind of represents closure, I think. Closure of, like, the first 20 years of this century. You know, in a weird way, for like, as terms of, like, media goes. 
I am unfamiliar with both franchises. Yeah, me too. That's fair. We have uh, anything else to say about this album, or do we want to uh, want to wrap this up? This is probably my favorite of the week. That's all I'll say. <laughs> fair. Yeah, fair my favorite of the week too. I'm 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 big thief nerd. Uh, favorite tracks. Uh, one last kiss actually probably my favorite of this and um. I, I did I did like face my fears actually. I, I thought those were some surprising songs in here. Least favorite, uh not in a mood actually gonna say it's my least favorite. I don't I don't disagree that it's a vibe, but I think it's a vibe that only lasts for as uh, long as it does and that length is not as long as the song goes for. Wow. You say that and you're not saying somewhere near Marseille. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh my favorites, Bad Mode, One Last Kiss, uh Not in the Mood. Least favorite, um, probably like that Nemo and when I or even face my fears. Like, I I I appreciate Skrillex. I think face my fears just has bad placement in the album because it's kind of like so much is so chill and relaxing, and it got like the one kind of poppier, kind of more high energy song, and it just seems a little incongruous. Which you know that's kind of the symptom of it being just a, single, a series of collections and singles and whatnot yeah. but yeah i think it's a good album i really appreciate that not to fucking like give myself too much praise i'm glad i chose this no i i get i get what you mean it, yeah it's a good album uh, my so, favorite oh you gotta do I, favorite, I, sorry. yeah I didn't, I didn't do favorites and least favorites not bad. my favorite is uh probably not in the mood and i really just don't have a least favorite it's a good album all right shall i do my ranking first uh, it's gonna be no surprise go ahead number three i was trying to spit when i said it but i can't uh oliver tree cowboys uh cowboy tears uh, two is uh, Hikar uh, Hikaru Yutada. Uh, it means don't worry. Uh, with it's bad bad mode, isn't it? Or was it bad mode? Bad mode. Bad mode. Good. Yeah, with bad mode and number one, big thief, uh, dragon, new warm mountain. I believe in you. I just uh, I'm I'm going to listen to that one more. That's all I can say. All right. Uh, for me, number three, Oliver Tree. Number two, uh, Big Thief. Number one, Hikaru Itada. I think Bad Mode's great. Uh, I think it's their first like bilingual release in terms of like the whole album is pretty much bilingual to some degree. I think that's yeah. pretty cool too. Yeah. Usually cool. it was like either Japanese or all English. Cool. Uh, for me, least favorite, uh, Big Thief, then into Oliver Tree, and then into uh, Bad Mode. Wait, Guru, yeah. what, so that was three, two, one. Yeah, three, two, one. Uh, number three, uh, Big Thief. Number two, Oliver Tree, and number one, uh, Bad Mode. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. I feel better about this then. <laughs> well, since you're feeling good, you want to announce what you're choosing for next week? Oh yeah, I am keeping the double album streak alive and going. Excuse me. I am choosing the new Beach House record, Once Twice Melody. Well, if you thought Big Thief was a drag, you're in for a wild ride. <laughs> I kind of like Beach House. I do like Beach House. I, 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 I haven't actually heard this album, but I've, I've heard that apparently it's very hard to uh, to listen in two in one, one sitting whilst focusing on it. So, Well... Right. We'll see how that compares to me listening to Dragon New Warm Mountain, I Believe in You. I, I haven't heard the Beach House album, so I, I can only tell you what I've heard. All right, I'll, I'll go next. Um, I initially was going to do an album by uh, B-52s, because uh, as Dominic is the only one in the in the uh, Jessica Harper fan club, I think I'm the only one in the Fred Schneider fan club. Uh, but uh, Ritz ruined that, and so instead we're going to be doing... The album from 1972 by progressive rock band Yes, Close to the Edge. It's only three songs long. I love I love how you go on very passive aggressive with this whole yeah Brits <laughs> ruin that kind of thing. Like I haven't ruined most of things I touch. Uh, <laughs> now that you two are done laughing and I go keep searching for that album on a uh, on Spotify, I will go and talk about. But I'm choosing for next week, and it's an artist back 
going back with the Australian artists because I was supposed to keep doing them and never do an international one and then I did kind of gave up on that and now we're here. Uh, going on to an artist that's been quite popular in Australia that I haven't done ever and have been meaning to and now we'll finally do because they released an album two days ago from recording. Uh, we are doing Gang of Youths Angel in Real Time. Youths Angel in Real Time. Okay. All right. All right. So to recap, that is Gang of Youths Angel in Real Time, Beach House, Once Twice Melody, and yes, Close to the Edge. Yes. Oh, there's a deluxe right. edition with four more songs. <laughs> <laughs> Did we do that version? I don't know. Yeah, there might be too many songs. Trix doesn't uh, which seem one? to be happy that we're doing any any song from this album. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, we, we're just doing the three song version with uh, the original, not the deluxe edition. Okay. Well, until hey. then, I have been Riddle, and you can catch me on our website, Riddle for Kids or GitHub.io. I also have a YouTube channel that's linked in the description below. I also put out an album two days ago as well that's just me hitting a desk and uh, blowing into a $5 harmonica I got a JB Hi Fi. It's as shit as you think it is, but it's uh, free on Bandcamp, which will be in the description below as well, hopefully. Yeah. I'm a Dominic. You can catch me on Twitter at D A C I C H O C K I. I've written for Tilted Windmill Studios in the past, currently have an article appearing in the new Lost and Cult issue coming out in a few months. I'm on YouTube, you can see my short film beat there if you really want to. I'm also on the Games My Mom Found podcast. The Games My Mom Found podcast here and there as a guest. Yeah, you can find me in certain places. Looks like uh, a laundry been... basket finds Dominic. <laughs> Long uh, seat that I... good one, Dominic, is that what you said? Look in the laundry basket. No. Tricks go. Tricks not tricks. Tricks go fuck <laughs> your shit. Uh, I've I've been tricks. You can catch me on Twitter at procrastinate underscore. It's like procrastinating astronaut then an underscore. Uh, I also have a YouTube video where I'm planning some really dumb videos coming up soon. And uh, yeah, you can catch us all at Dissonant Waves on Twitter and Dissonant Waves dot space. Thank you for the recording. I hope we all have a great night. And morning, yeah. and afternoon, and evening. See ya.